has said, I'm Betsy Tilson. I serve as the State Health Director for North Carolina. Um, so we'll cover a couple of topics today, and then we will also be um, turning it over to Attorney General Josh Stein and then Director Slayberry, um, and then we'll be able to um, answer some of your questions. So it's starting to become cliche, um, but the situation continues to rapidly evolve, as does our response. Um, and the actions that we're taking now, as other states are taking, is so that we can slow the spread of the disease, and so fewer people get sick at the same time, and then we don't overwhelm our medical resources. And so a lot of the actions that you have seen in the past week or two are to um, blunt that curve. I also want to reiterate some things that Secretary Cohen said yesterday. And we know there's been a fair amount of confusion about social gatherings. What's the right number? What's the right length of time? And so the bottom line is for people to use good judgment and practice what we call social distancing, which probably people are now very aware of that, of that term. That means staying away six feet from um, other people when possible. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Use san hand sanitizer. Don't touch your face and practice proper respiratory etiquette, meaning covering your cough um, with your elbow. At the same time, we also need to support those who are at higher risk of having complications with this infection. And again, we've said that in the past, that's people over 65 and those with underlying health conditions like lung disease, diabetes, heart conditions. And those, those people need to be extra vigilant and stay home to the extent that is possible. So we're also hoping that people think about your neighbors, think about your social networks. For those people in those high-risk groups, what can you do to support those people? Can you get groceries for them? Can you run to the, to the store from them? How can we support those, those people? I'm also going to revisit testing because obviously that has been a big um, point of interest. Um, and you will see um, as our posting on our dashboard this morning um, that we have 63 positive cases in 18 counties. Um, and we know, we know that more than 1,800 tests have been completed across the state. Um, and I say more than because some of that testing is reflected at the state lab, um, but also as more and more of our commercial and university partners come online, we know there's a lot of uh, uh, more testing that's going on across the state. And as a reminder, though, the positive tests that we get are reflective of all the testing that we're doing in the state. Again, our state lab is just a portion of that. Um, but as our hospital and commercial labs are, are testing, we are getting the number of tests from some of those, but not all of them. And that's why I said we know more than 1,800 tests have been done because there's a variety of settings that, um, that we're getting and we're not getting all of those, those numbers at this time. Um, ramping up testing right now um, is an important in this phase that we are in. Um, but this level of intensity of especially community-based testing will change as we move through um, that response. And so the importance of testing as we move through um, will be less important in the future. I also want to reiterate that the changes that we're making in our daily lives um, are hard. I think we need to acknowledge that this is really hard. Social interaction is what makes us human. I mean, all of this can really take a toll on our mental health. And so I just want to remind people that there is support and that's available. You, look, you can look to our resources on the website and also for us to all come together as a community um, and support each other as much as we can. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our Attorney General Josh Stein for some of his comments. Thank you, Dr. Tilson. I am Josh Stein, the Attorney General of North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Tilson just went through a host of ways, steps that we can take to prevent the spread of this uh, illness. We also have to prevent fraud and scams, because whenever a crisis like this occurs, there are bad people who will try to exploit people's fear, their desperation, their uncertainty to steal money. Uh, when the governor declared a state of emergency last week, that triggered North Carolina's price gouging law. It is now in effect. That means that it is illegal in the state of North Carolina for someone to sell a product that's important for life at an excessively outrageous price, uh, an excessively unreasonable price. We have so far received 136 price gouging complaints, half of which have to do with groceries, uh, the num number two complaint is hand sanitizer followed by cleaning products. We are in the process of investigating those complaints. Uh, we have not yet concluded that any of them violate the law. If we do so conclude, we will act quickly and aggressively to enforce the law against any price gouger exploiting people's fears. Other types of frauds and scams for people to be aware of are hucksters out there selling products 
making promises that simply cannot be true. They were snake oil salesmen in the 19th century. They're snake oil salesmen in the 21st. I just got an, uh, an email telling me, promising me uh, a miracle cure. There are no miracle cures. Dr. Tilson will tell you there isn't a cure, there isn't a vaccine. Science is working hard to try to develop both of those things, but they do not exist. And if someone's promising you that, they are trying to steal your money. Uh, in addition to the miracle cures, uh, we are seeing uh, an increase in phishing and telemarketing uh, robocall attempts. Uh, the phishing is a perfect example. The one that was promising a miracle cure uh, that I received this morning, I don't think they were stealing, trying to get my money. They wanted me to click on an attachment so they could steal my personal information. That's what phishing is all about, making you click something that will create a problem and open up your personal information to criminals. Uh, but we also heard, uh, we've heard from our, our partners both here in North Carolina, the AARP, and our federal partners, the FTC, that there is a robocall scam going on where people are getting calls at home and being told by the local health department that they have come into contact with someone who has the coronavirus and that they must be tested before they can leave their home and they can sell the person a test. Obviously, the local health departments are not doing this and would not do this. So if folks get calls like that, we have a robocall report task force that we've already established to try to protect folks from these criminals. That is 844-8-NO-ROBO. If you get one of these calls, 844-8-NO-ROBO. A final type of scam that occurs whenever there's a, a disaster, whether it's a hurricane disaster or a, a viral pandemic, is people trying to exploit folks' charity. We want people to reach out and support our neighbors in times of need, but understand that just because you get an email from a, an organization that has a good sounding name or somebody sending you a, a link on a social networking site about some people who are in desperate need of help, because you get that does not mean it is true. If you want to help, give money to the food bank, give money to the Red Cross, give money to organizations you know will put that money to good use. You want it to go to where you want it to go. You do not want it to line some criminal's pocket. If anyone sees any issues out there where they think there's a scam or there might be a scam or there is price gouging going on, we have a toll-free number. Our folks are still able to answer the phones and that's 877-5-NO-SCAM, 877-5-NO-SCAM, or just go to our website ncdoj.gov slash price gouging and we will be happy and uh, happy to investigate it because uh, our primary concern has to be about the public health it has to be about keeping people healthy and well and alive um, but we will not tolerate criminals trying to exploit people's fears to make a quick buck thank you Thank you, Attorney General Stein. My name is Mike Sprayberry. I'm the director of the North Carolina Division of Emergency Management. Today, we are standing up North Carolina 211 as a resource for people to call for assistance related to the COVID-19 coronavirus. People with questions about COVID-19 can dial 211, and based on the nature of their question, they will be routed appropriately for an answer. 211 can help people with needs like food assistance, support for families, and other basic needs. If you want to stay up to date on COVID-19, you can receive information by text. Just text COVIDNC to 898-211 to get regular information updates via text. We've been seeing a surge of non-emergency calls at our state's 911 centers related to COVID-19. We want to remind everyone that 911 is for emergency only. 211 is a good resource for non-emergency calls. I also want to address concerns about grocery stores. The state has no plans to direct grocery stores to close. We know that everyone needs groceries. The supply chain to our grocers remains strong and stores are getting regular deliveries and restocking. 
Please resist the urge to stockpile food or engage in panic buying. Leave some for others, especially those who can't afford to buy a lot of food all at once. Governor Cooper has requested a disaster declaration from the U.S. Small Business Administration. We expect to hear a response on that possibly as early as today. If that declaration is granted, it will make low interest disaster loans available to businesses that are suffering financially as a result of the outbreak across the entire state. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, for the reporters in the room, if you would just please walk to the uh, microphone if you've got questions. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some questions for Dr. Slayton. Um, how many drive throughs uh, labs do we have now in the state, or, or collection sites? Yeah, so um, there's a whole variety of different uh, al what we're calling alternative sample collection sites um, through some of our private partners are doing it on their own, some through of our public-private partnerships. So we don't have a number, um, but what we are doing is connecting our providers through their networks so that they can then refer their patients to those, um, to those alternative sample collection sites. I just have two other questions. Sure. One is, um, are you going to uh, request hospitals to stop elective surgeries anytime soon? We've heard of some hospitals. Yeah, and so we do have a very robust healthcare coalition and with our health systems all um, coming together, as you have seen, um, several of our big health systems are already um, starting to do that. And so we'll be having a good partnership and, um, and uh, coordination with our health systems. So not at this time, but maybe? Not at this time. Right. Um, and then the last thing is, um, are you guys considering bringing back like retired doctors and nurses to help with both my students? Yeah, obviously our healthcare workforce is something that we are, when we think about all of our resources, our healthcare workforce is one of those as well. And so we are thinking through all of our different possibilities to meet our healthcare workforce needs. You're welcome. Thank you for the questions. This is uh, Dr. Hilton. Mm -hmm. uh, first two questions, thank yeah. you. Uh, just a logistics thing about the count. I mm -hmm. saw that Durham County is now listing, according to your tally, 12 cases. I know that Duke University said yesterday they had at least cases do you know if there is there some um, what's the difference for the what's the reason for the differentiation there so again these numbers change all the time which is why what we're going to be reporting out every 24 hours on our dashboard is the numbers that we know as of that morning because those change those numbers are changing you know, all the time. I'm sorry follow up do you know if that does the 12 reflect any of those 15 uh, that Duke uh, reported so the f the 15 <laughs> reflect hmm. The, the 15 of our numbers reflect the 15 from the Duke. I don't know the, uh, the other ones that you were, but the, I know the ones this morning reflect the, the, the 15 from Duke. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and, and uh, well, okay, you I get that. I, get I think the point is that when we start chasing yeah, numbers, they change just, so quickly just, that it was just, so that's why every 24 hours we'll, we'll give you oh, those yeah. updated numbers every 20, and it will take a while. It, it, they'll be out of sync for a little sure. bit. That's why. That's just confusing. And yes, I have something exactly. for, <laughs> and I have something for Mike as well. Oh, sure. Uh, we've, my, we've heard some reports uh, from first responders out in the field and local fire departments and such that are running out of masks and other materials to respond to people's daily needs, especially if there's a concern that there may be a coronavirus case in that area or potential case. Do you, what do you know about that and what's being done to address it? We do know that there are some issues in the supply chain for personal protective equipment. Uh, we're working, uh, you know, seven days a week to try to address those. Uh, we're also obviously prioritizing who gets um, the PPE, um, with the top priority being healthcare workers and the second priority being our emergency responders. Um, we've actually been uh, still issuing PPE to emergency responders at lower levels and also with guidance to help it last longer and so uh, we know that that's an issue and we're working on it and um, it's a shortage nationwide right now what's the acronym ppe please uh, personal protective equipment thank you 
This is a question for Dr. Tilson, I believe. Um, England has recently included pregnant women in the high-risk category. Yeah. Do you have any guidance for that population? Yeah, and somebody asked that question a couple days ago. I can't remember. Um, but there is some now um, a little bit, uh, there's some new data that, that have um, uh, pregnant women now in that high-risk category. Um, and so we have um, that um, information on our website as well. And so, um, again, thinking through, again, same thing with our high-risk categories, 65 and over, underlying medical conditions. And then now we'll, we have now enough data to put our, our pregnant women in that high-risk category.